Hello and welcome to NEMO's second webinar in 2019. My name is Mira Höschler from the NEMO office. NEMO is the network of European museum organizations connecting national museum associations as well as individual museums and interest groups from over 40 countries. Being an ever-growing network so far, we have over 90 members. NEMO represents European museums towards policymakers on the national and EU level. Moreover, we share knowledge and train professionals in Europe through our training courses, learning exchanges and webinars. NEMO usually hosts around four webinars per year, facilitated by different museum experts in Europe about diverse topics in the museum field. The topic of today's webinar is from museum education to public engagement, trends and practices in European museums. And we are happy to welcome the facilitator, Margarita Sani. This webinar is an online version of a workshop facilitated by Margarita in Georgia in March 2019 in the course of the EU-funded project Be Museum, a cooperation between the Georgian Museums Association, the Academy of Cultural Management in Amsterdam, and NEMO. Margarita Sani works at the Instituto Ben Culturali of the region Emilia-Romana in Italy and is involved in many EU projects. Currently, she is a NEMO board member as well as the leader of NEMO's working group LEM, the Learning Museum. Margarita's work's focus, and also matter of the heart, is the education and lifelong learning in museums. Please feel free to ask questions with the chat function during the webinar. We will have a Q&A round at the end of the webinar, around five or two minutes towards the end. Soon after the webinar is finished, you will find the video on our um, YouTube channel. And I will now pass things over to Margarita and wish you all an inspiring and fruitful session. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mira said, this, is, uh, this webinar originates and takes place within the framework of the European project B Museumer, for which I delivered a workshop in Georgia uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, now, I was asked to concentrate in 45 minutes what I presented uh, during two days uh, recently in Georgia. So this is for me, as you can imagine, a challenge. Of course, this webinar is meant uh, for those who could not attend the webinar because there was a lot of participation, a lot of applications that could not be satisfied. So here I'm trying to concentrate in a short time what was uh, delivered in two days. And uh, also because I know that some of the people attending this afternoon are from the group that I met in Georgia, I don't want to bore them with the same sort of format. So I change it slightly and I will address the issue of museum education, public engagement from a different uh, point of view. Uh, and I will concentrate indeed on some keywords that characterize museum learning uh, nowadays. Uh, these are the key words that we will go uh, through together. Um, the first one is learning about heritage and learning through heritage. Now, in, in, in museums, uh, we, of course, we are used to deliver content. We are used to transfer facts and figures. But actually, something that characterizes today's museums uh, and, and their educational departments is that learning is not only focused on uh, the content that the museum is providing, but also on something else. Uh, let's look first of all uh, at the definition of learning, which is not, in fact, not such a new concept of learning as it dates back uh, from the campaign for learning uh, in the UK some years ago. But it is still for me uh, very important to identify what we're trying to do when doing museum education. It says learning is a process of active engagement with experience. It is what people do when they want to make sense of the world. It may involve an increase in skills, knowledge, understanding, values, feelings, attitudes, and capacity to reflect. 
Effective learning leads to change, development, and the desire to learn more. Now, as you see, this involves much more than conveying concepts, than uh, teaching history or art history. It is really uh, bringing about a change in the individual. So it is, in this sense, very challenging also for the museum professionals involved in museum education. And also another concept comes along, which is very relevant and has been very relevant ever since the uh, Lisbon strategy, the EU Lisbon strategy in 2020, well, actually not in 2020, it was 20, 2010, um, the concept of lifelong learning, all learning activities undertaken throughout life with the objective of improving knowledge, skills, competencies in a personal, civic, social or working perspective. And again, this draws a much bigger picture around learning and museum learning as well. And in fact, this is also reflected in the uh, ways in which we measure learning. I apologize for this uh, picture being a bit blurred, but you can, uh, as you will see during the course of this webinar, I will point to several uh, websites and, and resources that you can look at later on, um, because uh, indeed th there is a lot of ground to be covered. Now, this, uh, these generic learning outcomes, which were developed in 2001, actually reflect this broad concept of learning in museums. So, at the top, knowledge and understanding, which is the typical uh, outcome of a learning activity in a museum, that you increase your knowledge about the subject, but also skills, so something more practical, behavior, behavior and progression, so you change your behavior, of course, you enjoy, this is another uh, outcome, learning outcome of museum educational activities that you enjoy yourself, uh, that you have a quality time, that you are inspired, that you increase your creativity, and also attitudes and values. So also attitudes and values can be changed in a museum educational activity. And um, in addition to these, you will also find um, the equivalent uh, in the social uh, domain, so the generic social outcomes, again, outcomes that the museum can achieve with its activities, health and well-being, strengthening public life, stronger and safer communities. I'm not going to uh, dwell on these uh, concepts, but you can go yourself on the websites, on these two websites, and you will also find very practical materials um, templates and so on that can help you organize your activities and assess them especially because these are tools that are meant to assess the learning outcomes, be they educational or be they social. So let's go back to, to this idea of learning about heritage and learning through heritage. I'm sure that you're all familiar with learning about heritage. That's what you do in your everyday uh, work. Uh, <clears throat> learning through heritage a slightly different concept. Uh, how can it be achieved? You use the museum as an environment to teach something else. So something else is learned through the heritage, through the museum collections and so on. And I'm giving you a few examples. Uh, you, you might know the eight key competencies that the uh, European Union uh, delivered some years ago. These are transversal competencies and we, should all have or pursue, uh, of course, communicating in a mother tongue, in a foreign language and so on, but also digital competence, learning to learn, interpersonal, intercultural and social competencies and civic competence, entrepreneurship and cultural expression. Now, these key competencies, for instance, were used by uh, the institute for which I work um, to design a, a program which is called I Love Cultural Heritage, which provides funding for joint projects that schools and museums uh, design together and whose objective is actually not that of transferring information about the museum collections or heritage, but that of tra uh, transferring or uh, encouraging, uh, supporting the acquisition of transversal competencies. And um, for instance, digital competencies, cultural awareness, being aware of the heritage around you and also taking care of it, because this is our common good. Um, social and civic competencies, 
uh, and the sense of initiative and entrepreneurship. Uh, for instance, these young people um, produced, uh, as you can see, bags, um, starting from the museum uh, materials, such as uh, the banners that museums put up in the streets when they advertise uh, uh, an exhibition or so or something like that. Now, if you speak Italian and if you go back to the uh, link I, I gave you in one of the previous slides, you will see this uh, uh, initiative uh, described in detail and you will also find all the projects that uh, were supported financially in the past years. Um, but also another uh, outcome of, of learning in museums, another objective that the museum can, can uh, try to achieve is that of increasing well-being in people. And here, of course, there is a lot of literature about this. NEMO also delivered a webinar. And if you go on the NEMO webpage under trainings and webinars, you will find this, uh, the recording of, of this, uh, of this um, webinar. Uh, I'm just um, adding here the picture of the National Gallery in Rome, which uh, does um, educational activities for people with Alzheimer and their caregivers, uh, uh, which again benefits both the, the ill person and the caregiver, uh, because it also creates a, a situation where the two have something to share, something to talk about. Increased self-confidence. Uh, this is another outcome um, that can follow from a museum activity. And this example is the project In Touch, which was uh, developed uh, by the by two museums in Manchester some years ago, the Manchester Museum and the Imperial Museum, uh, Imperial War Museum North. Uh, they decided they wanted to um, increase the number uh, of volunteers and they invited people to attend uh, a course at the museum, which would, uh, which would uh, uh, at the same time give them content uh, about the museum heritage uh, uh, in the area, but also give them other skills that they could use in their practical life, in their everyday life, like writing the CV, like uh, presenting oneself. And, and, and the outcomes were really extraordinary in the sense that some people went back to school, some people uh, found a job, and, and of course, uh, some of them remained uh, in the museum as, uh, um, as volunteers. Uh, longer life expectancy can also be a surprising outcome of educational activities. This was uh, uh, an artistic uh, um, educational activity delivered uh, by the uh, Irish uh, Modern Art Museum. In, in Dublin years ago, and they did an extensive uh, review and assessment of the outcomes and what they, they, it was addressed to all people who probably also for the first time entered the museum and certainly for the first time were engaged in artistic uh, activities. And uh, what some of them replied that they got out of this was they, in, in addition to an increased well-being, also a longer life expectancy. So, I mean, sometimes they, they, the outcomes that uh, a museum activity can uh, achieve are quite uh, are quite uh, surprising, quite astonishing. And creativity, of course, lots of creative sessions, both for adults and older people, younger people in, in museums. But also a museum can be used as an environment to learn a language. And uh, there are lots of, um, lots of materials also. This is a, a, a project or a program rather that's been running in, uh, um, in, you, in the UK uh, museums for a long time, but also in other countries there are similar programs uh, to teach English uh, to speakers of other languages. So it's done in collaboration with uh, schools or with adult education uh, organizations. And there's also, if you search online, lots of materials that you can draw inspiration from. And finally, just finishing these examples of learning um, through heritage, you can learn how to write creatively. And this is a, a program of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, uh, which actually, uh, I think, combines and, and uh, catches uh, two birds with a stone, so to say, in the sense that invites you to look closer at pictures, uh, closer at artworks, in order to write creatively uh, about them. So your objective is that of 
learning how to write creatively, but this also requires a more attentive uh, look at, at the artworks. So and this is a sort of like the decalogue that they are providing to people who want to achieve their, that goal. So you see, uh, they, they really the they, the scope of what one can learn and what one can teach uh, in museums is very wide. Audience development is another key word. And it is very current. It's very, uh, it's, so to say, one of the one of the most important concepts that the European Union has tried to to put across, especially with its uh, latest uh, Creative Europe program. Uh, and audience development is both something that should be an horizontal uh, objective of all European funded projects, or it, could be uh, one of the main objectives or the only objective of a project. What does it mean? It means widening the audience, it means deepening the relationship with the audience and diversifying the audience. So not only widening, widening the already existing audience, but also uh, finding new people uh, that come to the museum uh, among the non-visitors. Uh, you, there is a lot. There is a, there was a project which is called Adeste that you can uh, search for, and also uh, there is a, a website, this website, where you will find uh, um, toolkits that we, you will find guidelines to um, achieve audience development and engagement as well. Basically, the the, con the basic concepts of this is. Um, placing the, the audience at the center and also involving the whole organization in this objective of being visitor, people-centered, audience-centered. How to develop the audience is a question that we should all uh, ask ourselves. Uh, first step is to map, to get to know the community. So get out and, and establish a close relationship with it. Mapping the community, who are the community, the communities, who are the people, who are the groups of people who are out there doing non-visitor research, uh, using participatory activities to attract more people and to engage them uh, in our uh, initiatives and also diversifying the staff so that the people find themselves reflected in, in, in our uh, staff members. Uh, I'm just giving you here a story of uh, an initiative in, in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, which I got to know uh, recently. And this is the Story House Belvedere. It is actually not a museum. But I think that what they did, it's a place now, a community uh, space that was, so to say, uh, reclaimed or um, achieved uh, from, the, from the municipality. And um, it's a place where people go and meet and tell stories. But I thought what I thought, so it's not a museum itself, uh, but it's an important and very active, lively cultural organization. Now, I was very uh, intrigued by the way in which they started going out and getting in touch with those communities. There are, uh, as they say, uh, 155 different interest groups in the area. This is the southern part of Rotterdam. So they went out and they asked these people if they could take pictures, and then they made a display in the streets. So that was the first, uh, the first uh, initiative that they uh, developed to to get in touch with those people, so that the people could uh, find themselves, uh, they could give visibility, and they could uh, recognize themselves as uh, stakeholders, interlocutors of um, of this uh, of this place. Um, Another example, and again, I have this uh, booklet in the resources that I will um, uh, provide you with at the end of this webinar. Uh, this is a research that was conducted uh, within the framework of the uh, LEM project um, some years ago. And uh, in the appendix, you will find uh, um, an interesting, uh, uh, the interesting uh, form that the Gallo-Roman Museum in Tongeren in Belgium used to do visitor research before they redisplay the museum. The museum is an archaeological museum, and they asked the people questions on how, of course, this is not legible here, but you can find it online. Uh, the questions I have the book here with me were, for instance, 
Um, are you more attracted uh, by a museum which provides clear and concise information about new research or which involves you and fascinates you? When you visit a historical museum, do you want to talk to your family or friends about what you see or do you prefer to explore on your own? So lots of questions that would actually provide the museum a pointer uh, in the direction uh, of where they uh, had to, to display the objects, uh, the way in which they should interpret them and so on. So non-digital research uh, and, and um, research done uh, before you you initiate something is very important. So this is also called the front end uh, evaluation. Participation is another very important uh, keyword and uh, very much used in uh, in the EU say jargon, uh, but also in general and especially after uh, the year 2010 when this um, when this book was uh, published the participatory museum by nina simon uh, of course she gives us in in her book and also in the publications that followed and also on the blog that she uh, takes care of uh, important uh, definitions of what is participation uh, basically participation is this uh, for her. In a traditional institution, you have the museum that delivers the content top down or information top down. And in a participatory institution, you have the museum that provides information, information, but also the people that react and provide their own messages, suggestions, content. And also, in addition to relating to the institution, they also relate to each other. So it's also a way. Uh, of connecting people with each other. Uh, some years ago, I conducted with other colleagues a research on participatory governance of cultural heritage, uh, which was uh, um, a European um, research uh, and a mapping of case studies. And uh, we put uh, these projects on a continuum. Uh, Nina Simon also provides this classification of different uh, participatory uh, methods. Um, from informing, which they, they go from a minimum to a maximum on the continuum. So the minimum is, of course, informing people, to consulting people, to ask for their collaboration, contribution, to sitting at the same table and deciding together, uh, acting together and, and hosting. Hosting is the maximum, say, um, participatory mode, a possible mode, in the sense that the museum offers itself as a place where people can set up their exhibition, can develop their contents, their narratives, and, and so on. And these, all these methods can be either initiated from top down or from bottom up. So with the colleagues who work with me, we put uh, some of these uh, case studies that we researched on the continuum. And we have, for instance, contributory collaborative projects, uh, for example, uh, at this uh, Finnish museum, which wanted to refurbish itself, and and um, and it, and actually submitted the, the sketches of the architects to the people uh, of, of the community, and sat together and, and shared ideas and and uh, started a discussion. Now, participatory uh, initiatives uh, can be very challenging because once you start, of course, you have to go along. So uh, the, there's also the discussion whether. All these talk about participation is rhetoric or is it, or is it really real? Uh, because indeed, once you, you see uh, your authority as a museum a little bit, at least a little bit, you have to go along and really listen to people and take into account their opinions, their suggestions, and so on. But it is surely also in museum education something which is very uh, recurrent and, and very much uh, present uh, nowadays. Um, and again, a uh, contributory collaborative project was the redisplay of the Riverside Museum in Glasgow, a transport museum which existed already in another building, in an old building. And when they moved to a brand new building, architecture by Zaha did, they uh, consulted with the public. And they, in order to consult uh, with the public, they divided up, they segmented the, the audience into these uh, five different groups, which uh, were their uh, key groups, um, key audience groups. 
and, uh, and consulted with them. So the community panel, the educational panel, the access panel, the team panel, and the junior panel. And each had uh, the possibility to contribute to the uh, making of this new museum. And surely, in some cases, the, the museum had to review its plans, especially with the access panel, uh, where accessibility, when tested by people with some kind of disabilities, turned out to be not exactly what it should be. So, again, participation is important, but it really requires the change, uh, changing the frame of mind and uh, uh, being open to modifying your plans. Uh, what they did at Riverside is also documented uh, on these uh, uh, booklets that are uh, available online and that tell the story of these, uh, uh, of these meetings with the different uh, uh, stakeholders of the museum and uh, also um, includes the, the minutes of the meetings that they had. So it's, it's very interesting and a very nice example to look at. Uh, they always in Glasgow, uh, way of uh, making people participate is the open museum, which is um, a way in which the, the museum, the Glasgow Museum, goes out to the community, especially to areas that are uh, disadvantaged, and brings objects, but also uh, objects that people can, uh, can use, can see, can learn about. But uh, at the same time, it brings out to the communities the expertise of the curators, of the restorers, and so on. Uh, and in indeed, it leaves the freedom to, to communities to think of initiatives that they want to set up. And so the, the expertise of the museum people is put at their disposal. What are the implications of participation for museum learning? Uh, surely it means, as I was saying, um, encouraging visitors to complement the stories that, uh, that the museum provides. So this can be done very simply by uh, letting people uh, leave a message, uh, post it, and so on. Um, or uh, in a more engaging uh, and challenging way, actually inviting people to sit at a par with the curators, with white gloves, and uh, interpret the objects. And this has been done extensively for many years now by the Manchester Museum, what they call collective conversations. And uh, they set up, uh, they of course invite people uh, to look at their depot and to uh, select objects. Uh, sometimes objects are uh, from different cultures. This is a museum, a university museum, the Manchester Museum, which uh, has also uh, very important ethnographic collections. So sometimes it is the people um, who come from the countries to which those objects belong that can add uh, a new perspective, new stories to those objects. And uh, the museum uh, puts it very, uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, what they want to do is uh, to make space for multiple uh, voices and uh, uh, multiple visions and interpretations. Uh, saying that the significance of a museum lies not only in its collections, but also in the reflections and insights it is able to trigger around the objects. So it is a bit of, of a revolution, so to say, and in George Hines' words, acknowledging that the museum is not the repository of the truth, but that its contents are arranged by fallible and culturally influenced humans, leads to the suggestion that the messages emanating from museums are themselves stories, narratives to be read and understood by the visitor. So uh, this idea of creating multiple uh, perspectives, different narratives, different stories is, uh, is again uh, very crucial nowadays. It is something that uh, many museums practice or try to put into practice and of course this is important also when it comes to museum education. Uh, a hosted project which I had the pleasure and privilege to visit at the National Museum in Warsaw uh, gave children uh, 6 to 16 years old, divided up into groups, the total freedom to organize an exhibition in the main uh, exhibition area of the museum. 
they selected different subjects, they um, went to meet the curators, the restorers, they chose the objects, they organized also the multimedia tools uh, that were used, and um, they did the uh, media uh, campaign, they um, conducted and they the press conferences, uh, they wrote the captions, and, and so on. So this is a, a, a very good, and all this was recorded and assessed, evaluated by the museum. This was a top-down initiative, so it came from the director, and it really uh, had an impact on the organization at all different levels, and all levels of the organization and the children and the facilitators in these workshops themselves were uh, interviewed at the end, and so it was a big assessment for the museum. Uh, another concept which I would like to explore is that of public and publics. The idea that uh, ever since Gardner came out with the uh, concept of the multiple intelligences, which makes us all feel cleverer in the sense that if I'm not good at mathematics, well, all right, I might be good in verbal linguistic, or I might be good in music, uh, or in, in, in uh, other uh, physical activities, so I'm also intelligent. I have uh, multiple. I have uh, di a different intelligence than what is uh, normally um, evaluated through the IQ uh, tests. So this idea of multiple intelligences and of multiplicity and of the different uh, ways in which people um, perceive and, and, and experience the world is also has many important implications also for museums. And I would like to introduce uh, uh, the learning theory by David Kolb, but there are others also. Uh, Kolb uh, calls uh, this, uh, this uh, theory the experiential learning theory because it starts from concrete experience. You, this is the circle of learning. You start from the experience, you reflect on the experience, you observe, you reflect. Then you draw the concepts out of this uh, observation and reflection, and, and then you experiment again, and the circle goes on and on. And now, actually, you can start anywhere in, in the circle, uh, and anywhere you can have a full uh, experiential learning um, but experience, but, uh, but you have to complete the, the circle in order to, to really learn. Now, um, um yes you can you can enter the, the cycle at, at any stage um so cold learning theory uh what, what does it have to, to to what does it mean for museums for museums it, it means that uh, people have a preference uh, of a certain style because uh, um what in they indeed comes out uh, of the of the of this uh, idea of the circle of, of the cycle is that uh, at every uh, on, on every say um, encounter of the different ways of, of learning uh, of feeling of uh, experiencing you have a, a different uh, learning style so um, the, you have the diverging um which is at the crossing of the concrete experience and reflective observation you have the assimilating you have the converging the accommodating i'm not going to dwell long on this and on these uh, uh diagrams you can go back to them but what it's it's important is to well now this is not very readable um maybe we can change the color of these uh, of this link when we before we upload the, the, the webinar, the, the, but anyway, um, you can take the learn uh, the learning style questionnaire, Cobb's learning style questionnaire yourself, and decide and find out what is your preferred or your prevalent learning style. What are the implications for uh, museums? Some years ago, the Dutch Museums Association uh, published a book on Cobb's learning styles and its uh, impact on, on museums because again it reinforces the idea that we are all different so both in educational activities and also in displaying the, the collections we should try to encounter and to meet the needs and expectations of different people 
So not just one. We tend also very easy for us also to replicate what we're good at, what our preferred learning style is, also in museum education. Um, so they, um, in, in, in several uh, museum exhibitions, they set up different displays that would actually appeal to the different uh, learning styles. This is for the diverger who uses imagination, feelings and creativity. Then there is the simulator. This is the very logical type. He uh, or she uh, likes the chronological presentation of events, uh, likes uh, concepts, numbers, um, and uh, rationality, and so for the simulator, there's the typical timeline with theory, logic, facts. Uh, then there are the convergers who are problem solvers and use their learning to find solutions to practical issues. And here you have a person who is invited to compare the theory with the facts. And uh, finally, you have the accommodator, uh, the hands-on person who likes to learn practically. And in any exhibition, you should have um, or in, in any learning activity, you should have something that also engages these people or some people practically. Um, again, uh, this is, as in any theory, is a simplification of reality, is a model, so we should take it for what it can give us, but for sure what it should give to museum educators are is the idea that um, activities should be designed and carried out uh, in ways that offer to each learner the, ch the chance to engage in a manner that suits them best. So there should be something for everyone. And in fact, this is a very interesting and uh, telling diagram of the NEMO uh, Science Center Museum in Amsterdam. This is how they uh, represent their visitor experience. Of course, there is a lot of theory behind this. Uh, the visitor experience is at the center and all around it, the different ways in which uh, a museum visitor can be engaged, either by transferring the facts, concepts, and uh, abstract insights, so that's the knowledge and insight, or by uh, letting them participate, or uh, by engaging them in cognitive, social, emotional, aesthetic activities, or make them reflect. So, Every time they uh, start to think of a new exhibition, they decide, who do I want to address? And uh, this decision is very important to then shape the, the, the final outcome. Emotions. Now, this is something which has become uh, recently uh, very, let's say, fashionable. I don't want to say. But there is a lot of uh, production on this and uh, a lot of events. Um, also recently, uh, I participated in two of these events, one in Italy and one in Berlin. And uh, I must say that there is a lot of attention to emotions. Why? And what does it mean for museum education? Because, again, it is closely linked to what I've said before with regard to cold learning styles. People are a whole of different things. People are a brain, a soul, and also emotions. So in trying to cater for all these different, uh, say, facets of a, of a person or a personality, we should also consider the emotional aspect. In addition to this, all these uh, events and seminars I attended recently or in the last years about museums and emotions um, established something which is undisputed. That is that emotions uh, are a good precondition for learning. So you can actually effectively learn if you are emotionally involved. So also as museum educators, you should try to uh, catch the attention, arouse the, the emotions of the, of the people. Um, and this is a, a, a quote by a colleague uh, in one of these uh, workshops that were um, organized in Italy uh, in the last years. Uh, why is this emotional uh, aspect of learning a uh, changing paradigm? Because now that we are uh, shifting the focus, 
as it has happened in the last decades, from museum collections to the visitor, we also have to take into account the emotional aspects of, of our visitors and offer them a varied uh, scenario of possible cultural experiences. Again, this idea of a plurality, that it's not uh, one audience, uh, a general, say, visitor, an average visitor. No, it is a variety of different individuals. Can museum trigger uh, emotions in all of its functions? For me, there are two main ways uh, for museums to, to arouse emotions. Now, of course, there are some museums that are themselves, in themselves, um, emotional or, or um, can, can actually arouse uh, strong and deep emotions. For instance, this is the reconstruction of a, of a room in which people lived uh, during the siege of Sarajevo. And this is reconstructed in the Museum of Contemporary, um, the Modern Museum of Contemporary History in Sarajevo. It's there with no caption, nothing. You don't need anything. You just enter uh, in the, you, you, you feel empathy for, for, the, for the people who live there because you, you can see what it was like uh, to, to concentrate in one room all your belongings, all your life, eating, living, sleeping, and so on. Other uh, very emotional museums are, again, in, in Sarajevo, the World Childhood Museum, which collects objects that uh, belong to, to children, or yes, well, the children toys or children belongings during the uh, Sarajevo siege and the war in the Balkans, or the Museum of Broken Relationships, which um, actually is uh, staged in different museums, started out in Zagreb and, and shows uh, the objects of uh, that characterized, uh, um, or, or uh, say, iconic objects of uh, relationship, love relationships that uh, that were broken, uh, that ended. Huh? One object, one story. So the idea of storytelling. Storytelling is very important. So arousing emotions, I said, in the museum can be done in two ways: either through the displays, and we have a variety. I'm sure that you've also experienced a variety of uh, uh, museum environments that are immersive, that, that really uh, take you to a different world, to a different uh, period in time, and so on. Uh, and of course, you can do it uh, through educational activities. Uh, these are two Dutch museums. Um, the museum of the, focused on the period of the Second World War, uh, which encourages young people to, uh, to tell stories, to invent stories, uh, using the, the object, to, 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 first of all, to hear the, the real stories attached to objects and then to invent their own story. And uh, the uh, Tropen Museum Junior, which actually recreates the environment of different countries according to the different um, to the different uh, exhibitions they put up. So indeed, it is very emotional because again, it is very immersive. You actually land in another uh, place when you enter those uh, exhibitions. Uh, and storytelling, as I was saying, is, is very important because it is through stories that, that museums can engage people and, uh, and also um, ask them to, to contribute with their own personal uh, viewpoint. Uh, the Resistance Museum Junior in Amsterdam is uh, a museum which has uh, chosen to do so uh, by recreating the, say, the environment, the living environment of four uh, young people, uh, real character, not fictional, um, but of very different kinds. As a young boy who um, lived in a family engaged in the resistance, a Jewish girl, and so on. And what you do, the way in which the museum engages the public, the young public in this case, is to let you uh, go through the door into the house of these uh, people, look at their objects, look at their stories, read their, um, their documents, and so on. So again, uh, it can be very emotional. Uh, there is another tendency, um, in addition to, um, uh, say, uh, arousing emotions in people, there's also, say, uh, uh, an important line of, of thought, of research that 
says that museums should teach emotions or should um, help people to become empathetic. All of this because there is an empathy deficit. This is very much uh, in North America, the US and Canada, uh, this, uh, this uh, line of thought. And, uh, and so uh, museums should actually uh, use uh, their collections uh, and their initiatives, their activities to uh, improve and to encourage, uh, increase empathy in individuals. Now, this is something that maybe could be the uh, topic for another uh, webinar. Uh, now, because the time is up, nearly up, and there's going to be 10 minutes for questions, the questions that you sent or that you want to send now uh, in the chat, I'm going to leave you with some resources because, again, uh, there's a lot of ground that I didn't touch and that was uh, touched upon uh, during the, the uh, workshop in, in Tbilisi. Uh, well, uh, for instance, we didn't deal with the different kind of publics, the children, the adults, the older people, and so on. So I'm just pointing to you some resources. One is this, the NL Factor, a journey in the educational world of Dutch museums. This is a research I conducted um, last year, which is published by Nemo. You will find it uh, online. And uh, these are also, in short, the main outcomes of, of, the, of the research. What do children like? What do Dutch museums use to engage children in, in education? Uh, so it's two, two slides that I'm leaving you with. But also uh, the webinars, uh, past the NEMO webinars, um, where you will also find this NL factor because I also delivered the webinar on this. And as I uh, said to you, there's also a webinar on museums and well-being and also a webinar in French on uh, the role of emotions in museums, the uh, point of view of the scenographer. And of course, there are lots of publications online. One is this, uh, the Lifelong Learning in Museums Handbook, which was the outcome of a European project. And um, in Pilisi, we looked at the different uh, um, aspects of, and, and, and here I, I'm summing them up for you, uh, that encourage and support learning in museums. First of all, the environment, which is very important. The environment can be conducive to learning in a very, very relevant way, also because many people visit the museum just uh, by themselves without a planned activity, without taking part in a workshop and so on. So the environment itself can really contribute to learning. Adults, and the old book is on adults, families, young people, I'm just going through very quickly, older people. So you will find ideas and also guidelines uh, there in this publication and also outreach activities where the museum goes out and brings its uh, objects and knowledge outside. And then there are all the publications of the Learning uh, Museum project and uh, another uh, list of resources that you can uh, or you might want to uh, look at yourself and, and study individually. So uh, this is for me the last slide. I 